the park, James Matthews. He looked longingly at the children on the other side of the railings, the children sliding down the chute, landing with feet astride on the bouncy lawn, screaming as they almost touched the sky with each upward curve of their swings, their joyful, demented shrieks at each dip of the merry-go-round. He looked at them, and his body trembled and ached to share their joy, buttocks to fit board and hands and feet to touch steel. Next to him, on the ground, was a bundle of clothing, washed and ironed, wrapped in a sheet. Five small boys, pursued by two bigger ones, ran past, ignoring him. One of the bigger boys stopped. What are you looking at, you brown ape? the boy said, stooping to pick up a lump of clay. He recognized him. The boy had been present the day he was put out of the park. The boy pitched the lump, shattering it on the rail above his head, and the fragments fell on his face. He spat out the particles of clay clinging to the lining of his lips, eyes searching for an object to throw at the boys separated from him by the railing. More boys joined the one in front of him, and he was frightened by their number. Without a word, he shook his bundle free of clay, raised it to his head, and walked away. As he walked, he recalled his last visit to the park. Without hesitation, he had gone through the gates and got onto the nearest swing. Even now, he could feel that pleasurable thrill that traveled the length of his body as he rocketed himself higher, higher, until he felt that the swing would upend him when it reached its peak. Almost leisurely he had allowed it to come to a halt like a pendulum shortening its stroke and then ran towards the seesaw. A white boy, about his own age, was seated opposite him, accordion-like their legs folded to send the seesaw jerking from the indentation it pounded in the grass. A hand pressed on his shoulder, stopping a jerk. He turned around to look into the face of the attendant. Get off, the skin tightened between his eyes. Why must I get off? What have I done? He held on, hands clamped onto the iron attached to the wooden seesaw. The white boy jumped off from the other end and stood, a detached spectator. You must get off, the attendant spoke in a low voice so that it would not carry to the people who were gathering. The council say, he continued, that us blacks don't use the same swings as the whites. You must use the swings where you stay his voice apologizing for the uniform he wore that gave him the right to watch that little white boys and girls were not hurt while playing. There is no park where I stay. He waved a hand in the direction of a block of flats. Park on the other side of town, but I don't know where. He walked past them. The mothers with their babies, pink and belching, cradled in their arms, the children lolling on the grass, his companion from the seesaw, the nurse girls, their uniforms, their badge of indemnity pushing prams. Beside him walked the attendant. The attendant pointed an accusing finger at a notice board at the entrance. There, you can read for yourself, absolving him from all blame. He struggled with the red letters on the white background. Lankus Alien, whites only. He walked through the gates and behind him the swings screeched, the seesaw rattled and the merry-go-round rumbled. He walked past the park each occasion he delivered the washing, eyes wistfully taking in the scene. He shifted the bundle to a more comfortable position, easing the pain biting into his shoulder muscles. What harm would I be doing if I were to use the swings? Would it stop the swings from swinging? Would the chute collapse? The bundle pressed deeper and the pain became an even line across his shoulders and he had no answer to his reasoning. The park itself, with its wide lawns and flower beds and rockeries and dwarf trees, meant nothing to him. It was the gaily painted red and green tubing, the silver chains and brown boards, transport to Never Never Land, which gripped him. Only once, long ago, and then almost as if by mistake, he had been on something to beat it. He had been taken by his father, one of the rare times he was taken anywhere, to a fairground. He had stood captivated by the wooden horses with their gilded reins and scarlet saddles dipping in time to the music as they whirled by. For a brief moment he was astride one, and he prayed it would last forever, but the moment lasted only the time it took him to whisper the prayer. There he was standing, clutching his father's trousers, watching the others astride the dipping horses. Another shifting of the bundle, and he was at the house where he delivered the clothing his mother had washed in a round tub filled with boiling water, the steam covering her face with a film of sweat. Her voice, when she spoke, was as soft and clinging as the steam enveloping her. 
He pushed the gate open and walked around the back, watching for the aged lap dog, which at his entry would rush out to wheeze asthmatically round his feet and nip with blunt teeth at his ankles. A round-faced African girl, her blackness heightened by the white starched uniform she wore, opened the kitchen door to let him in. She cleared the table and he placed the bundle on it. I call madam, she said. The words spaced and highly pitched as if she had some difficulty in uttering the syllables in English. Her buttocks bounced beneath the tight uniform and the backs of her calves shone with fat. Are you sure you've brought everything? was the greeting he received each time he brought the bundle. And each time she checked every item and as usual nothing was missing. He looked at her and lowered his voice as he said, Everything there, madam. What followed had become a routine between the three of them. Have you had anything to eat? She asked him. He shook his head. Well, we can't let you go off like that. Turning to the African woman in the white starched uniform. What have we got? The maid swung open the refrigerator door and took out a plate of food. She placed it on the table and set a glass of milk next to it. The white woman left the kitchen when he was seated and he was alone with the maid. His nervousness left him and he could concentrate on what was on his plate. A handful of peas, a dab of meshed potatoes, a tomato sliced into bleeding circles, a sprinkling of grated carrot and no rice. White people are funny, he told himself. How can anyone fill himself with this? It doesn't form a lump like the food my mama makes. He washed it down with milk. Thank you, Annie, he said as he pushed the glass aside. Her teeth gleamed porcelain white as she smiled. He sat fidgeting, impatient to be outside, away from the kitchen with its glossy tiled floor and steel cupboards ducoed a clinical white to match the food-stacked refrigerator. I see you finished, the voice startled him. She held out an envelope containing the Rand note. Payment for his mother's weekly struggle over the wash tub. This is for you. The five cent piece was dropped in his hand, a long fingernail raking his palm. Thank you, madam. His voice was hardly audible. Tell your mother I'm going away on holiday for about a month and I'll let her know when I'm back. Then he was dismissed and her high heels tapped out of the kitchen. He nodded his head at the African maid who took an apple from a bowl bursting with fruit and handed it to him. He grinned his thanks and her responding smile bathed her face in light. He walked down the path, finishing the apple with big bites. The dog was after him before he reached the gate, its hot breath warming his heels. He turned and poked his toes in its face. It barked hoarsely in protest, a look of outrage on its face. He laughed delightedly at the expression which changed the dog's features into those of an old man. See you do that again? He waved his feet in front of the pug's nose. The nose retreated and made an about turn, waddling away with its dignity deflated by his affront. As he walked, he mentally spent his sixpence. I'll buy a penny drops, the sour ones that taste like limes, a penny bull's eyes, a packet of sherbet with a licorice tube at the end of the packet, and a penny star toffees, red ones that turn your spit into blood. His glands were titillated and his mouth filled with saliva. He stopped at the first shop and walked in. Trays were filled with expensive chocolates and sweets of a type never seen in the jars on the shelves of the Indian shop on the corner where he stayed. He walked out not buying a thing. His footsteps lagged as he reached the park. The nurse girls with their babies and prams were gone, their places occupied by old men who, with their hands holding their stomachs, were casting disapproving eyes over the confusion and clatter confronting them. A ball was kicked perilously close to an old man, and the boy who ran after it stopped short as the old man raised his stick, daring him to come closer. The rest of them called to the boy to get the ball. He edged closer and made a grab at it as the old man swung his cane. The cane missed the boy by more than a foot, and he swaggered back, the ball held under his arm. Their game was resumed. He watched them from the other side of the railings, the boys kicking the ball, the children cavorting on the grass, even the old men senile on their seats. But most of all, the children enjoying themselves with what was denied him, and his whole body yearned to be part of them. He looked over his shoulder to see if anyone had heard him. It, he said louder. On them, their park, the grass, the swings, the seesaw, everything. His small hands impotently shook the tall railings towering above his head. 
it struck him that he would not be seeing the park for a whole month, that there would be no reason to pass it. Despair filled him. He had to do something with his anger. A bag filled with fruit peelings was on top of the rubbish stacked in a waste basket fitted to a pole. He reached for it and frantically threw it over the railings. He ran without waiting to see the result. Out of breath, three streets further, he slowed down, pain stabbing beneath his heart. The act had brought no relief, only intensified the longing. He was oblivious of the people passing, the hoots of the vehicles whose paths he crossed without thinking. And once, when he was roughly pushed aside, he didn't even bother to look and see who had done it. The familiar shrieks and smells told him that he was home. The Indian shop could not draw him out of the melancholy mood, and he walked past it, his five-cent piece unspent in his pocket. A group of boys were playing with tires on the pavement. Some of them called him, but he ignored them and turned into a short side street. He mounted the flat stoop of a two-storied house with a facade that must once have been painted, but had now turned a nondescript grey with a red brick underneath showing. Beyond the threshold, the room was dim. He walked past the scattered furniture with a familiarity that didn't need guidance. His mother was in the kitchen, hovering over a pot perched on a pressure stove. He placed the envelope on the table. She put aside the spoon and stuck a finger under the flap of the envelope, tearing it into half. She placed the rand note in a spoutless teapot on the shelf. You hungry? He nodded his head. She poured him a cup of soup and added a thick slice of brown bread. Between bites of bread and sips of soup which scalded his throat, he told his mother that there would not be any washing coming during the week. Why? What the matter? What I do? Nothing. Madam say she go away for months. She let Mama know she back. What I do now? Her voice took on a whine and her eyes strayed to the teapot containing the money. The whine hardened to reproach as she continued, why don't you let me know she going away, then I look for another, Merim? She paused. I slave away and the pain never leave my back, but it too much for her to let me know she go away. The money I get from her keep us nice and steady. How I go cover the hole? He wondered how the rand notes he had brought helped to keep them nicely steady. There was no change in their meals. It was, as usual, not enough, and the only time they received new clothes was at Christmas. I must pay the burial, and I was going to tell Mr. Lemonsky to bring lino for the front room. I'm sick looking at the lino full of holes, but I can forget now. With no money, you got as much hope as getting wine on Sunday. He hurried his eating to get away from the words wafted towards him, before it could soak into him, trapping him in the chair to witness his mother's miseries. Outside, they were still playing with their tires. He joined them half-heartedly. As he rolled the tire, his spirit was still in the park on the swings. There was no barrier to his coming, and he could do as he pleased. He was away from the narrow streets and squawking children and speeding cars. He was in a place of green grass and red tubing and silver steel. The tire rolled past him. He made no effort to grab it. Get the tire! You sleep! Don't you want to play any more? He walked away, ignoring their cries. Rage boiled up inside him. Rage against the houses where they streaked walls and smashed panes filled by too many people. Against the overflowing garbage pails outside doors, the alleys and streets, and against the law he couldn't understand. A law that shut him out of the park. He burst into tears. He swept his arms across his cheeks to check his weeping. He lowered his hands to peer at the boy confronting him. I think you cry. Who say I cry? Something in my eye and I rub it. He pushed past and continued towards the shop. Cry, baby. The boy's taunt rang after him. The shop's sole iron-barred window was crowded. Oranges were mixed with writing paper and dried figs were strewn on school slates. Clothing and crockery gathered dust. Across the window, a cockroach made its leisurely way, antennae on the alert. Inside, the shop was as crowded as the window. Bags covered the floor, leaving a narrow path to the counter. The shopkeeper, an ancient Indian with a face tanned like cracked leather, leaned across the counter. Yes, boy? He showed teeth scarlet with beetle. Come on, boy, what you want? No stand here all day? His jaws worked at the beetle nut held captive by his stained teeth. He ordered penny portions of his selection. He transferred the sweets to his pockets and threw the torn containers on the floor and walked out. Behind him, the Indian muttered grimly, jaws working faster. One side of the street was in shadow. He sat with his back against the wall, savoring the last of the sun. 
bull's eye, peppermint, a piece of licorice, all lumped together in his cheek. For a moment the park was forgotten. He watched without interest the girl advancing. Mama say you must come and eat, she stared at his bulging cheek, one hand rubbing the side of her nose. Gimme. He gave her a bull's eye, which she dropped into her mouth between dabs at her nose. Wipe your snot, he ordered her, showing his superiority. He walked past. She followed sucking and sniffing. Their father was already seated at the table when they entered the kitchen. Must I always send somebody off to you? His mother asked. He slipped into his seat and then hurriedly got up to wash his hands before his mother could find fault with yet another point. Supper was a silent affair, except for the scraping of spoon across a plate and an occasional sniff from his sister. A thought came to his mind almost at the end of the meal. He sat, spoon poised in the air, shaken by its magnitude. Why not go to the park after dark? After it had closed its gates on old men, the children, the nurses with their prams, there would be no one to stop him. He could think no further. He was light-headed with the thought of it. His mother's voice, as she related her day to his father, was not the steam that stung, but a soft breeze wafting past him, leaving him undisturbed. Then qualms troubled him. He had never been in that part of town at night. A band of fear tightened across his chest, contracting his insides, making it hard for him to swallow his food. He gripped his spoon tightly, stretching his skin across his knuckles. I'll do it. I'll go to the park as soon as we finished eating. He controlled himself with difficulty. He swallowed what was left on his plate and furtively watched to see how the others were fearing. Hurry up! Hurry up! He hastily cleared the table when his father pushed the last plate aside and began washing up. Each piece of crockery washed was passed to his sister, whose sniffing kept pace with their combined operation. The dishes done, he swept the kitchen and carried out the garbage bin. Can I go play, Mama? Don't let me have to send for you again. His father remained silent, buried behind the newspaper. Before you go, his mother stopped him. Light the lamp and hang it in the passage. He filled the lamp with paraffin, turned up the wick and lit it. The light glimmered weakly through the streaked glass. The moon, to him, was a fluorescent ball, light without warmth, and the stars, fragments chipped off it beneath street lights. Card games were in session. He sniffed the nostril prickling smell of dacha as he walked past. Dim doorways could not conceal couples clutching at each other. Once cleared of the district, he broke into a trot. He didn't slacken his pace as he passed through the downtown area with its wonderland shop windows. His elation seeped out as he neared the park and his footsteps dragged. In front of him was the park with its gate and iron railings. Behind the railings, impaled, the notice board. He could see the swings beyond. The sight strengthened him. He walked over, his breath coming faster. There was no one in sight. A car turned a corner and came towards him, and he started at the sound of its engine. The car swept past, the tires softly licking the asphalt. The railings were icy cold to his touch, and the shock sent him into action. He extended his arms and, with monkey-like movements, pulled himself up to perch on top of the railings, then dropped onto the newly turned earth. The grass was damp with dew and he swept his feet across it. Then he ran and the wet grass bowed beneath his bare feet. He ran towards the swings, the merry-go-round, seesaw to shoot, hands covering the metal, up the steps to the top of the chute. He stood outlined against the sky. He was a bird, an eagle. He flung himself down on his stomach, sliding swiftly. He rolled over when he slammed onto the grass. He looked at the moon for an instant, then propelled himself to his feet and ran for the steps of the chute to recapture that feeling of flight. Each time he swept down the chute, he wanted the trip never to end, to go on sliding, sliding, sliding. He walked reluctantly past the seesaw, consoling himself with pushing at the one end to send it whacking on the grass. He grunted as he strained to set the merry-go-round into action. Thigh tense, legs stretched, he pushed. The merry-go-round moved. He increased his exertions and jumped on, one leg trailing at the ready to shove if it should slow down. The merry-go-round dipped and swayed. To keep it moving, he had to push more than he rode. Not wanting to spoil his pleasure, he jumped off and raced for the swings. Feet astride, hands clutching silver chains, he jerked his body to gain momentum. He crouched like a runner, then violently straightened. The swing widened its arc. It swept higher, 
higher, higher, it reached the sky. He could touch the moon. He plucked a star to pin to his breast. The earth was far below. No bird could fly as high as he. Upwards and onwards he went. A light switched on in the hut at the far side of the park. It was a small patch of yellow on a dark square. The door opened and he saw a figure in the doorway. Then the door was shut and the figure strode towards him. He knew it was the attendant. A torch glinted brightly as it swung at his side. He continued swinging. The attendant came to a halt in front of him, out of reach of the swing's arc, and flashed his torch. The light caught him mid-air. God damn it, the attendant swore. I told you before, you can't get on the swings. The rattle of the chains when the boy shifted his feet was the only answer he received. Why you come back? The swings. I come back for the swings. The attendant catalogued the things denied them because of their color. Even his job depended on their goodwill. Bloody whites. They get everything. All his feelings urged him to leave the boy alone, to let him continue to enjoy himself, but the fear that someone might see them hardened him. Get off! Go home! He screamed, his voice harsh, his anger directed at the system that drove him against his own. If you don't get off, I go to the police. You know what they do to you. The swing raced back and forth. The attendant turned and hurried towards the gate. Mama! Mama! His lips trembled, wishing himself safe in his mother's kitchen, sitting next to the still-burning stove with a comic spread across his knee. Mama! Mama! His voice mounted, wrenched from his throat, keeping pace with a soaring swing as it climbed the sky. Voice and swing, swing and voice, higher, 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 until they were one. At the entrance of the park, the notice board stood still, its shadow elongated, pointing towards him.